Welcome to another episode of the Nation's Best Brotherhood Podcast presented by Trophy Case Digital Trading Cards. Make sure you guys head over to Trophy Case. Check it out. It's for every single athlete. You need to jump on this right now. And today on our podcast, we're going to be listening to sports agent Lee Steinberg and learning from him more about his Super Bowl party that he has coming up and the ties to Sony Studios that the, the, the party will be actually hosted at. We'll be talking to him about his experience as an agent, and we'll be asking him the question, what does brotherhood mean to you? You don't want to miss this episode, so stay tuned. Welcome to the nation's best brotherhood podcast. I'm your host, Shane Larson, the Game Time Guru, and we're honored to be sponsored by Trophy Case Digital Trading Cards. The nation's best brotherhood podcast will be about the importance of brotherhood in sports. Each podcast episode will feature an interview with today's hottest athletes, coaches, league executives, and VIPs. The interviews will give you insight into their successful journeys in sports. The finale of each episode is where we ask our special guest one simple question. What does brotherhood personally mean to you? What's up, everyone? Welcome out to another episode of the Nation's Best Brotherhood Podcast. Today, we are honored to be joined by Lee Steinberg, as we're going to be talking to him about the Super Bowl party that he's got coming up here shortly, as well as some other stuff and just learning about um, his experience as an agent. And we're going to be asking him the question that we do on this podcast of what does brotherhood mean to you? So first and foremost, Lee, thanks for joining us and, and taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, allow us to chat with you today. My pleasure. And it's it's awesome. It's awesome speaking to you. Um, it's just you're a, you're a big name figure in this world. And I think it's just amazing that we can learn from somebody like you. You know, I've been following your social media channels for quite some time now. I love, you know, the Wednesday wisdom stuff that you do. You, you drop a lot of content on there, I'm, and I'm always been a fan of yours. So first and foremost, we want to talk about the Super Bowl party that's coming up. That's a big event. Um, so do you mind elaborating a little bit about the Super Bowl party that you got coming up and uh, what it's all about and who's going to be there? So the Super Bowl, if you will, is like a convention of Americana, big business, big politics, big sports, big entertainment. And oh, incidentally, there's a football game there somewhere <laughs> in this next week. Um, and so I wanted to do a party which was the antidote to the noisy, boozy, overcrowded, dark parties. And this is a daytime party with people from all those areas we raise money for the Lantern Network, uh, which is a mentoring program that helps uh, inner city kids break into business. We do humanitarian awards to an owner, general manager. We have the general manager of both the Chargers and the Rams, uh, Tom Telesco and Les Snead. And we're honoring them for philanthropic things they do off the field to sort of bring the good news that surrounds a sport like uh, football. And then we're, we're exploring the issue of concussion again with my 17th Brain Health Summit. So we've got new protocols like hyperbaric oxygen and light stem and stem cells that we'll be uh, displaying. So... It'll be interesting, and the, the venue is Sony Studios, which is where we filmed a little bit of Jerry Maguire, and um, it's, uh, uh, so it, it will be a fundraiser, educational, and, and also uh, a lot of fun. That's so cool. Yeah, there's going to be some big names there, and you mentioned Sony Studios, where they filmed Jerry Maguire. You know, if, if people are living under a rock, they might not fully know this yet, but hopefully they do. You know, Jerry Maguire, you have some ties to that movie. You know what I mean? And um, for, for those who might not fully understand, what was your role in, in that movie, I guess, as far as like wh what part did you take in, 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 in the filming of that movie? So Cameron Crowe, the writer, director, uh, had done a film called Fast Times at Richmond High that I thought was very funny. And he asked if he could follow me around and be a fly on the wall. Uh, for a film that would center on a sports agent. So he came to the NFL draft in 1993, where I had the first pick, Drew Bledsoe. He came up with us to the press conference with the Patriots. He came to the league meeting where I was showing off uh, uh, free agent players. He came to pro scouting day at USC. He came to the Super Bowl and spent time in my office. And I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. <laughs> and he went off and wrote the script. So I was technical advisor. So 
I had to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture did not get broken. So you knew it was genuine. The uh, dialogue was authentic. And then he assigned me actors like Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, who I took to the Super Bowl in Arizona, and I made him pretend he was my wide receiver client all week. So he hung with uh, Desmond Howard and Amani Toomer. And then um, I actually had to show the quarterback in the film, played by Jerry O'Connell, how to throw a spiral because he had gone to NYU and they didn't have football there. And uh, so it's a 25 year anniversary and rarely have I been in an airport or out to dinner where someone didn't run up to the table or and ask me to say the four words or say them to me that start with show me the. Yeah, I love that, man. That's so cool. You mentioned something that's interesting there, Lee, throwing a spiral and how, you know, you had to teach the guy how to throw a spiral. Another guy who you in your real life that you were connected to, which is Steve Young, actually didn't know how to throw a spiral when he first got over to BYU when he was young, young. I read a, I read a whole book on him called My Life Behind the Spiral. And for those who didn't know that, Steve Young literally didn't know how to throw a pass properly because they were running a triple option in high school, which I didn't know that my whole life. Um, of all the big name guys that you've worked with, you know, Steve, Troy, and then now Patrick Mahomes, these types of, these types of uh, figures that you've worked with, do you have any that like stick out to you as far as why they are such um, outstanding human beings? Well, Warren Moon was the consummate role model. He played for 22 years. And the quality I looked for was, was the athlete willing to retrace their roots and be a role model? <clears throat> Were they willing to go back to the high school, set up a scholarship fund or work for a Boys and Girls Club or be part of um, some community outreach? Would they do it at your college? Could we put together a charitable board that would have the leading figures in politics and, and uh, business and community leaders to do a program like work done giving the 175th single mother and her family the first home they'll ever own by uh, making a down payment and moving them into the home. So it's athletes changing lives. Um, so Patrick Mahomes is an extraordinary person. If you like him on the field, you'll love his 15 in the Mahomes that uh, aids all sorts of children's charities in Kansas City. Um, uh, obviously, Steve Young went to the Super Bowl Troy Aikman went to the Super Bowl. Ben Roethlisberger went to the Super Bowl. Patrick's been to the Super Bowl. So, But you're looking for that special quality of caring. And also, what does the player do in adversity? When the quarterback's throwing a couple interceptions, the crowd's booing, and the game's getting out of hand, do they have the ability to compartmentalize, adopt a quiet mind, and elevate their level of play in critical situations. Um, that's the magic that that separates great players from average ones. You know what's interesting that you just said that too. I'll, I'll dissect that for a second. Russell Wilson, another quarterback in the NFL right now. He his mental consultant, his name was Trevor Moad. Rest in peace. Trevor just passed away a couple months ago. But I read a book of Trevor's called. It takes what it takes, and it's about thinking neutrally. Anyway, the whole concept is specifically geared towards athletes, and it's exactly what you're talking about when they face adversity, especially quarterbacks and at a high, high level like the National Football League. You know, how do you when, when it's all great when things are dandy, but when the adversity hits, how do you how do you respond to that and be able to continue to execute at a high level without having to deal, you know, you know, do too much with with the outside noise? And so it's interesting because all those men you just mentioned right there, there's a common de denominator there. One, they're great human beings, but two, they actually understand how to face adversity and, and, uh, you know, perform under pressure. Um, and, we, and we, oh, go ahead. we all do. Um, yeah. and because life will push you back and you won't achieve or accomplish everything you want. And some situation out of your control will frustrate you. Can you be resilient? Can you, uh, get, push back, but rise again to, to uh, continue to endeavor. I love that. I love that. You know, Lee, um, one thing that I remember you saying a while back was with these guys that you were talking about, the Warren Moons, the, the Steve Youngs, the Troy Aikmans, the work done. You talk about all these guys. 
you once said that for these guys, one of the things that you do to try to keep them out of trouble is to not, you, you, you talked about it once about how they stay out of trouble and, and, and the distractions and everything that happened as a professional athlete. And I would love if you could elaborate a little bit about that and what you try to, with your clients that you, that you take on, what's one of your biggest ways that you can actually help them stay out of trouble. Cause when you get into the, the limelight, you have the money, you have the bling, you have all the, the accolades, but then there comes some problems. They always say more money, more problems. How do you make it so that your athletes that you have, your clients, um, don't necessarily run into that trap, I guess. So the best <clears throat> cure is prevention. And it's having a discussion with an athlete where they understand that they're going to be handsomely compensated for being in a pro sport. But the trade-off is their behavior has to be beyond reproach. And every time they leave their house, they're in a under a microscope. So it's understanding that not to get into a car with alcohol in your system. It's understanding not to go to a place for alcohol to serve where, where people get into fights. It's understanding not to put your hands on any other person in anger, especially not women, and be careful in your relationships. And that if you don't want to live up to those standards, you can go play on a sandlot. But if you want to be part of professional sports, um, this is the the critical key and you have to make your mind up while you're going into the sport that you're going to be circumspect in those public behaviors and if you don't want to be judged just stay home i like that a lot i hope everyone listening right now is taking some notes whether it's on your phone or you're taking actual physical notes take rewind that and listen to lee for the last 60 seconds and and take notes on that piece you know, Lee, the presenting sponsor of our podcast uh, is Trophy Case. It's digital trading cards. And I wanted to, you know, I know you've been, um, I guess, someone like Bob from, from Nation's Best has made you familiar with what Trophy Case digital trading cards are. And I'm just curious, with the digital trading card market, with Trophy Case, if you have any thoughts on that particular business model, and um, if, if so, what are those thoughts on Trophy Case? Well, the first key is understanding that for many people, their information source and frame of reference is the computer, the computer screen, the cell phone. And so this new reality means that the ability to get an iconic painting or an iconic photograph, a critical moment, a nice piece design, and to be able to have ownership of that and access to that is a huge premium. And for hardcore sports fans, that magic moment, that iconic situation, to be able to recapture that is lots of fun. And so this is the world today. And um, it's, it's an adjustment to people who are used to use trading cards in their bicycle spokes to make noise. <laughs> but the, we're, we're living in a, a cloud world in a virtual world where what used to be virtual is now reality. I love everything that you're saying. It's like perfect. I mean, we are going to the digital world. Um, I, and I just think it's interesting to, to see the, the evolution of that. I love that right there. Two questions left for you, Lee, to respect your time today. The first one being name, image, and likeness. Um, that's a new thing that's been rolled out for collegiate athletes as of the last 12 to 16 months. Um, it's, it's a new thing. Um, do you see in, in, in your professional experience that you've had, I mean, you're dealing with these athletes that are at the professional level, but they're obviously coming out of college. So you know who these people are. Do you think that the name, image and likeness, I guess, legalization across and, and, and regulation across the, the country is a good thing for athletes? Um, or what are your thoughts on uh, the NIL going around in collegiate sports at this moment? I do think it's a good thing and it's here to stay and it hadn't even been 14 months. It's just How been July 1st. Um, there have always been athletes who are on a college campus who come from tough circumstances and they would send a scholarship part of it home to their family and they would live at a lower standard of living than their non-athletic peers. So that um, because if you're not an athlete, you can work during the school year or you get an allowance for your parents, but athletes can't do that. <clears throat> so this has always been a problem. 
And the NCAA could have fixed it much easier by granting players with needs stipends where they got a little more money and, and the rest of it. They didn't. So California passed SB 206 a couple of years ago, and people at colleges across the country feared that California athletes would get ahead because they'd be able to do um, hire a marketing agent and do endorsements at a uh, very early age. So this starts as early as high school. And what we've seen is that it's not just a couple star quarterbacks. It's uh, every athlete at Oregon from Phil Knight. It's female athletes. It's it's uh, Olympians. It's um, um, and, and many of those colleges have affinity groups that really um, are uh, excited about the college. And so these alums own businesses and they, they will, will help. And it's 15 guys named Sam given stipends from Sam's Club who are, it's 15 guys named Jack from Jack in the Box. So it's been a veritable explosion. It changes the agency business because it forces uh, a conversation with much younger people than normally we'd be talking to. And, you know, the danger is that you could take a young athlete and put his profile so high when his accomplishments on the field are not there yet that it could make him look uh, presumptuous and, uh, and be premature. But its time has come, and it's just going to continue to expand and get more elaborate. And um, um, the uh, uh, that cow has left the barn. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. So, Lee, last question for you. This is the the whole premise of this podcast and this branding around it for Nation's Best is is brotherhood. And so, the question we ask our guests on this show is, what does brotherhood mean to you? So, I will ask you, Lee. Uh, uh, through all your experience, whether it be through competing or whether it be through, you know, and being an agent for those athletes and being around the game, what does brotherhood mean to you? It means that my dad used to say to me, when you're looking for they or them to solve a problem, you know, the amorphous they, older figure, political figures, he'd say, you could wait forever. The they is you, son. And he emphasized two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. So at the end of the day, what are you left with? You're left with, did you try to make a difference in the world? And what are the quality of your relationships? Were you a good friend? Were you there for people in times of crisis? Were you um, a good father, a good son? So brotherhood, the sense of camaraderie, two people with shared values, caring for each other and uh, experiencing life together is, is uh, in many ways, besides spiritual values, the meaning of life. I absolutely love it. Again, a golden nugget from Lee Steinberg that you guys can just go ahead and take notes for. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate your time, sir. I, I just appreciate you joining the Nation's Best Brotherhood podcast and sharing your, your information with us. And uh, good luck with the Super Bowl party and all the endeavors moving forward, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Take care now.